with um, Joshua 17, actually, verse 13, and then I will pray for us. Okay. Give you a second to flip there. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanite, Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. I'm gonna pause there. God, we love you. Lord, we worship your name. We praise your name. We wanna continue not only in song, but in the washing of your word again, Lord. And uh, we just come before you, God. Just build us up in the most holy faith, Lord, to honor you, to trust in your name, and to know Jesus more throughout this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, guys, I wanna ask you something. Have you ever had that thing in your life that you can't seem to kick? Right, that thing in your life that seems to hold you back or slow you down. Remember, we're in Joshua 16 tonight, in case you're wondering where we are. Holds you back and slows you down. You might even think it's been gone for a little bit, and then it seems to creep its way back into your life. Right? Ever had something like that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then when it creeps your way back into your life, maybe sometimes you just give up. Like me, maybe you're like me. And you're like, oh, I just give up already. And then only to find out that it's grown more and more and more as you left it alone, right? Oh, scary thing to think about. <laughs> and hey, don't be looking next to your partner next to you right now and thinking they're right next to you, okay? Because I don't want to get you guys in trouble. That's not who I'm talking about. Talking about inside of here, that thing that seems to grow, right? And it kind of reminds me of pest control, you know? Like I remember we traveled a lot when I was younger and um, believe it or not, when my family saw what we called the 747 plane cockroach that seems right to come your way inside of the living room, I don't know about you, man, but all of us in that house turn into little girls. We scream to the top of our lungs. And then if, whether that thing is alive or dead, mom says we're spending the rest of the night cleaning the whole house top to bottom, up and down for the rest of the day. That's what you're doing. Hope you had no plans because that's what you're doing, right? <laughs> and it's just crazy that we would go through something like that. And don't act like you, you don't know what I'm talking about, right? Like screaming like little girls because if you see a centipede crawl on your leg right now in, this, in these pews, you'd be screaming like little girls too, and not only that, but you'd probably be staying afterwards cleaning the whole area because you, you don't want centipedes in your seats, right? And so I wondered to myself, why then don't we treat our Christian walk the same way? What I'm going there with is when we see something in our house, in this house here, seem a little off or seem funky, like it doesn't belong and it freaks us out like that, why don't we flip it upside down, like cleaning up the house, get it done right, get it, get, clean it all up, get it out, right? Why don't we do something like that? And maybe you do. But that's my question for those who, who maybe understand where I'm at right now, is why don't we do something like that? Maybe for you, it might be explosive temper. Or it might be a fragile self-image of yourself. It might even be a gluttonous appetite or a distrust for authority. Or it might be sexual temptation. Some heavy stuff. Why don't we drive it out? I mean, it's just as gross as cockroaches and centipedes, right? <laughs> Why don't we drive it out? And so, you know, I remember thinking about that earlier this weekend, and it reminded me of when I was younger in my walk, claiming to know Jesus Christ, and um, I struggled with all these things, you know, these strongholds in my life. And I asked myself, God, where are you? You know, I was like, do you even care? Maybe you've been there with me where you find yourself um, like making deals with God. You're like, okay, if you do this, you know, I'll do this. And then only to find yourself failing and to put yourself down in even more and, and I'm wondering, does he even exist? Does he care about you? Does he think about you? Those sorts of things. So what I want to talk about tonight is how we shift from feeling, from feeling crushed to conquering. I want to talk about, as we read through this text, you guys, uh, we're going to discover how we can break down the strongholds in our lives and experience lasting victory every day through Jesus Christ. 
Right? And so if you're already falling asleep, like you was back in the day when I was a little kid, if you're already starting to fall asleep and you don't get anything out of this, I want you to get this. The strength to destroy the strongholds I was talking about in our lives comes through our faith in Jesus Christ and his, in God's promises. Faith in Jesus Christ and God's promises. So take it. It's yours. Remember that movie? Sorry for some of you who are not movie buffs. That was lame, right? <laughs> so Take it, it's yours, right? But really, think about it, you guys. Our faith in Jesus Christ and our trust in God's promises are faithful to get us through the strongholds in our life. That's what I think we're gonna see in chapters 16 and 17 tonight, so let's get to work. Okay, so it says in 16, the allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. Then going from Bethel to to Luz, it passes along to Adaroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Japhletites, as far as the territory of lower Beth-horon, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. Note this, in verse four, the people of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, Receive their inheritance. That's what we're talking about. Manasseh and Ephraim, their tribe and what they're receiving. Now pause there for a second because you might already be a little bit like me and saying, okay, Chauncey, hold up here, hold up. Because I get we're in Joshua. Joseph pops up out of nowhere. Okay, and then now you're telling me all this is going to be linked to strongholds and, and Jesus. There's too many J's. I can't count all these J guys. Is, you know. And So let's pause. Let's stop and slow down for a second and let me break it down, right? So we have Joshua, right, the writer here. We have Joshua, who is from the tribe of Ephraim, 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 right? Ephraim and Manasseh, the two brothers, who are sons of Joseph. Everybody remember Joseph, right? He was, he was the guy that, you know, God gave him a vision, um, got a fancy coat. His brothers didn't like him that much, were jealous. They threw him in a pit. You know, he, was, he remained faithful, And uh, then his brothers ended up bowing before him as as the vision showed him, right? Remember that Joseph. That's the Joseph we're talking about. The Joseph that was second to last in the inheritance of their patriarch, Jacob, right? Israel, the 12 tribes, second to last, right? And so Jacob, because of his love for them and Joseph's work, he brings Ephraim and Manasseh, into the family, adopts them, all right? That's where we're at right now. Adopts them into uh, the 12 tribes right now. And you have Joseph taking the place of preeminence. If you don't know what that means, guys, just a fancy word that means he, he, gets the, um, he gets the reward or the birthright or the inheritance of the firstborn child, right? And so Joseph gets that place and brings Ephraim, Manasseh, his sons, and is adopted into you know, Jacob's immediate line, and they receive an inheritance they could have never believed. And that's what Jesus did for us. That's what God did for us when he loved us so much that through the work of Jesus on the cross, he brings us, Ephraim and Manasseh, into an inheritance that we could have never have imagined or believed. And now we are called the sons and daughters of the true living God. Think about that, right? Just insane. And that's what we're reading. That's how heavy this passage is. And so sometimes it can be easy to gloss through, but that's the heaviness of what's going on in that first sentence. The allotment of the people of Joseph. And it goes down that path to tell you what they were given. And so you might be asking, okay, I get it. The line, the connection, I see it. But what does this have to do with the strongholds in my life? Guys, I want to ask you a question if you're asking yourself that tonight is do you really understand and see and know the love of God for you in your life? Do you understand his grace for you in your life? And if you could see that in what I just explained and what we just are kind of going to be reading here through 16 and 17, then you guys are going to be really, you should be unpacking the idea that God's love for you is woven all throughout Scripture. And, And I think that's where we would find it in places Like Ephesians 2, when it says, because of his love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even while we were dead in our transgressions. Like, hallelujah. 
Thank you, God. You see him all throughout scripture, right? And if you get that, if you can grasp his love for you and the grace bestowed upon to you through the inheritance that you're going to receive, then you will start to see and understand what happens in your heart, the transformation that occurs in your heart, right? What it'll do, what God's love will do for you, right? And, you, and yeah, you know, heaven is amazing. Yeah, you know, God's creation is pretty amazing. I like to surf. Who likes to surf, right? We love to surf. It's amazing. But when you really begin to unpack and understand God's love for you and his grace for you, it takes so much more precedence over everything else because it transforms your life, changes you. And then you begin to really understand 2 Corinthians 5 when it says, He died so that all may live and that those who live may no longer live for themselves but for the one who died for them and was raised and so that's my question with the strongholds in your life. Are you living like that? I love surfing, like you said, but I don't live for surfing. I live for the one who died and was raised for me, right? What are you living for today? And I promise you, we're going to get through chapters 16 and 17, even though we're only on verse 4. Okay, so let's keep reading here. Joshua 16, 5 through 10, the, uh, Ephraim's territory established here. Um, it says, the territory of the people of Ephraim by their clans was as follows. The boundary of their inheritance on the east was Adarothadar, as far as upper Beth Horon, and the boundary goes from there to the sea. On the north is Mikmathath, then on the west, the boundary turns around towards Tanath, I planned it way better in my head, okay, Tanath, uh, <laughs> Shiloh, and passes along beyond it on the east to Genoa. Then it goes down from Genoa to Adaroth and to Naira and touches Jericho, ending at the Jordan. From Tapua, the, to Apua, the boundary goes westward to the brook Cana and ends at the sea. Such is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Ephraim by their clans, together with the towns that were set apart for the people of Ephraim within the inheritance of the Manassites and all those towns with their villages. Stop for a moment because, oh, that's a lot of stuff we're reading there. And I want you, you know, I think to myself, man, being a Hawaiian boy myself growing up, I always had this dream that, like it would ever happen, like getting some sort of homestead land, you know? <laughs> like there would be some sort of opportunity to get some, some land, right? And so I want you to think to yourself, as I look out to you guys tonight, I want you to think, when you get home tonight, if you were to get a letter in the mail that says, hey, congratulations, so-and-so, you just got a large plot of land on Kauai, and all you have to do is go to the office to claim it to see what you got, your plot, all right? So you and your giddy self do some, you know, somersaults, and you get over there, and you claim your plot, and... Um, they begin to tell you, here you go, you can have it, but um, we also want to let you know one thing. There's, a, there's some landmines in your plot, and uh, some, some things underneath the ground that, that we don't know if they're still active, they, they're probably still active, but uh, you can go ahead and move on in. <sighs> I don't know about you guys, but hey, some of you guys probably would move in, honestly, but, <laughs> but really, let's be real about it because I would not move my family in there. My kids aren't playing outside in that land. We're not having church barbecues outside in that land, that's for sure, right? We ain't moving in there until it's cleared out and we feel like we can get inside of there. So why then, as we go into the last verse in chapter 10, do we see this whole awesome, amazing experience laid out? They're receiving this amazing inheritance and yet we see here, the landmines. However, they did not drive out, like you can read it, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have, but have been made to do forced labor. Made to do forced labor, okay, but the point is that they were told to possess the land and drive them out, but they kept them there. Why they kept them there, we'll talk about that here in, in chapter 17 in just a minute. But what a note I just wanted to point out is that they kept them there. And believe it or not, this is going to come back to bite them in the butt, you guys. We're going to see this later on. This is going to bite them back in the butt. And what we see is in 16, in 15, I'm sorry, it was laid out the same way. It says it at the end of chapter 15. 
We see it here at the end of 16. We're going to see it again at, you know, in chapter 17, this warning over and over. And like I was saying before, how God's love is woven all throughout Scripture, can we agree that God's warning signs, his like, warnings for you in your life, things to look out for, are woven all throughout Scripture as well? Right? And I think we can miss it sometimes. Woven all throughout Scripture. So why then, out of all that God had done for them and brought them through, why then were they so laid back, you know, to, to getting these Canaanites out of their land? Would you be so laid back to getting those landmines out of your land? No way. Right? Why then would they be so laid back about it? And you guys, how does this relate to the strongholds in your life? This is symbolism. That's the beautiful thing about Scripture. Symbolism all throughout Scripture, right? Right? And so what we can take from here, you guys, what we can, can use in our lives is that this is the idea of sin in our lives, like not getting it out of your life, right? Like I said, woven all throughout Scripture. And I love that when, you know, I go into like 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, I think that's something that's, been, that's, that's relatable to this in the sense that Paul is saying here, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Right, so cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened for the Christ, the Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What does that mean? Guys, when you want to make bread, you might go to food land and get some yeast, but they, you know, in the little yellow packet, you guys know what I'm talking about, yeah. So, um, or maybe you just buy it as is. But um, when you go get the bread back in the day, it was, you got to take some of the old bread to make the new leaven, to make it rise, right? And so when he's saying the Passover lamb has been sacrificed, The house, the house, right, what they're talking about there, needs to be purged of all of the old bread, the old stuff, because the new stuff needs to be here and live in there. Nothing else lives in there. Don't allow any piece. You you realize at Passover, when they would celebrate that, they would have to, like, sweep all the crumbs outside. Everything of the old bread would have to be out, not even a little bit. So he's saying that. You are unleavened. No old stuff, only the new stuff. Because the Passover lamb, Christ's blood, has been sacrificed. Here on out, the old is gone, the new has come. Okay. But we see here in this situation, they did not learn. They did not see that. Right. The symbolism in there that we can get from this experience. So let's keep reading on here. Joshua 17, 1 through 13. Like I promised, we're going to get through it. Then the allotment was made to the people of Manasseh. For he was the firstborn of Joseph, to maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted Gilead and Bashan, because he was a man of war. And allotments were made to the rest of the people of Manasseh by their clans. Uh, this is the tough part. Ebiezer, Helic, Israel, Shechem, Hefer, Hefer, don't ever call someone Hefer, and Shemida. These were the male descendants of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their clan. So we have the breakdown of the clans here, right? And what I can't gloss over, you guys, it's so important tonight, is now Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, son of Gilead, son of Maker, son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters, and these are the names of his daughters. Stop there because if you're like me, you're already thinking this is like a family reunion where like auntie goes and tells you, this is how so-and-so is related to your uncle, sisters, brothers, cousins, former roommates, other, and you're just airhead spinning, right? So I want you to pause there, stick with me, and realize that we're talking about here, Zelophehad's kids were all girls. And we're going to see their names here. Mala, Noah, which I didn't know was a unisex name. Hogla, never Hogla, please. Milka, And Tirza. Here's what they did. They approached Eleazar, uh, the priest, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the leaders, and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. Let's pause there because I want you to realize something that this Zelophehad's kids, this is referencing back to Numbers 27, where it talks about how they changed the norm. The norm back, you know, in those days was the husband gets the land, the inheritance. Why? Because of protection for the land. If the woman gets the land, now the women did get other inheritance from their family, but if the woman gets the land, they might be likely to marry somebody outside of their tribe, maybe outside of the nation, and then you have other 
uh, men coming into the land to possibly rule it down the line, to claim it, right? So this was a, a type of protection, but it's super neat how God granted this access. If you look back in that Numbers 27, God granted that to happen because of the faithfulness of Zelo- Zelophehad, their dad, because of his faithfulness. God grants them this, changes the norm, and then tells Moses to give them to the inheritance that they're going to get down the line. To give them that inheritance. And now they're here to claim it. Think about that. They're the, they're, they could have sat back and let it all happen, but no, they were faithful, brave, courageous women of God that decided to step up and claim the promise that was theirs. And they claimed it in the name of God, right? And so what happened? Um, so, let's continue on there. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their fathers. Thus there fell on Manasseh, Manasseh two ten portions besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is on the other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with the sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh. We're going to continue on in a second. But again, I just want to highlight and make sure you understand there these faithful women of God. We're going to talk about what that would have been helpful for here in a minute. And what happened? They were granted the land because of their bravery, because of their courageous heart, you know, to follow after the promises promise God gave them. So let's continue reading here. The territory of Manasseh reached from Asher to Michmethath. And here we go, all, all into the territory that they get. Okay, so don't, don't gloss over it. Just get an idea here. It's a big chunk, with, with, uh, which, e- which is east of Shechem. Then the boundary goes along southward to the inhabitants of in Tapua. The land of Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but the town of Tapua in the boundary of Manasseh belonged to the people of Ephraim. Then the boundary went down to the brook Cana. These cities to the south of the brook among the cities of Manasseh belonged to Ephraim. Then the boundary of Manasseh goes on the north side of the brook and ends at the sea, the land to the south being Ephraim's and that to the north being Manasseh's with the sea forming its boundary. I know I'm going here. Stick with me. On, the land's going to continue to be laid out here. On the north, Asher is reached. That's my son, yeah. On, and on the east, Issachar. Also in Issachar and, and in Asher, Manasseh had uh, Bethsian and its villages. And Eblium and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Endor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Tanakh and its villages, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. The third is Naphath. And here is my big point through this. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities. But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong... They put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. If we go back to verse 3, remember what I was just saying there? How awesome and brave and amazing those women were and courageous in claiming the promise that they had before them, stepping up to the leaders, saying, this is what God has given us. We're going to claim it by the name of God, by his words, right? Man, if they had taken that same vote of confidence and copy-pasted, cut, paste, whatever, to the end there, and all the people had applied that to this situation, man, it might have played out so different. And it wouldn't have come back to bite them later on in the butt, probably, right? And so, guys, I know I'm talking about all this stuff, and it's like, what does this have to do with the strongholds in our lives? And I want you to know that, remember, these were courageous women of faith that changed the norm and held on to God's promises. So one thing I want to ask us tonight, with the strongholds in our life, even small, like with their situation, they just allowed them to kind of stay, you know, kind of be there. It wasn't a big deal kind of to them, right? Um, even though it might be the strongholds in your life might be strong, are you doing something about it? Are you standing up like these women we just saw a minute ago? Are we men or women of deep faith? who take action according to God's promises, like these women, right? Guys, I want to just through this encourage us to be a family that lives under God's promises every day. 
And here's the thing. The, the reason, the purpose for this is because the enemy is persistent, like we see here. Persistent, won't give up. So we need something better than just us, right? Because if these women were just themselves, I don't think it would have played out that way. But God's promises, remember, God's promises, that's why the scripture is called sword of the spirit. God's promises are like sledgehammers into the strongholds of our lives internally. Destroys them, breaks them down, right? So I want to encourage us, this is going to be just a little assignment. If you're, if you're with me, raise your hand. Everybody has to raise their hand. Okay, perfect. So we're all going to do this assignment. <laughs> I won't hold you too much to it. Don't worry. Next time I come and speak, I want to encourage us, next time I talk, two weeks from two, three weeks from now, Lord willing, if I come and talk here, I want to challenge us to begin using the sword of the Spirit as a sledgehammer into the strongholds of our current everyday life now. And by doing that, I want us to try and memorize two pa- short passages. Okay. If we commit to that. Romans 8, write it down. Romans 8, if you got something with you. Romans 8, 1 through 1 and 2. Romans 8, 1 and 2. If you already know what it is, maybe you could say it with me. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. You might, you know the rest? Oh, I didn't hear it. Okay, so now there is no condemnation, condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because we belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has given us freedom. It breaks the power of sin and death. Right? So that's what we're going to memorize. This one. Just that Romans 8, 1 and 2. Breaks the power. Active in our everyday life. Now there is no condemnation. Use that. Sledgehammer that through the strongholds that might be inside of your life that might be trying to hold you down now even in a small way. There's no condemnation for you anymore for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, use that. So we're going to memorize. The other one, we're going to memorize. I don't have this one memorized. I'm sorry, you guys. Romans 5, 6 through 8. Some of you, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 3 through 5. Some of you may already have it down. um, But write it down, write it down, write it down. We're going to try to memorize it. Romans 5, 3 through 5. It says, not only that, But we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So whatever you endure, whatever you have in this life, remember, God's building faithfulness inside of you. And not only that, but he's giving you his love and his Holy Spirit to fill you through that process. But you got to know where it is and what it means or what it's from in the passage, right? So memorize it. We're going to memorize those two. Can we do that? Sweet. Next time I come up, hopefully I get it. (laughs) I remember. (laughs) Right? So let's continue on. Let's finish it out here. Joshua 17, 14 through 18. Let's flip back. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, why have you given me but one lot, they're complaining here, and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me. Kind of complaining, right? And Joshua said to them, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourself to the forest and there clear the ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and uh, Rephraim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said to the hill country, is not, uh, it is not enough for us. And here's where they tell the truth. Remember what I was asking before? What, are they, what is going on? Why are they allowing this to happen? Here's where they tell the truth. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Bethshean and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. And I want to stop there because I want us to realize something that well, number one, don't you hate it when, like, someone just trying to help us, and they really just called you out, and you kind of got caught, and you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, I really, you know, I really was fearful about this or that, or, you know, it kind of stinks, right? And so that's, that's what's happening here is Joseph is, um, uh, Joshua, I'm sorry, is really trying to help them and say, listen, you, this land is yours. It's promised to you, but you got to do some work. This ain't no lazy land, people, right? You can't just move on in and think it's going to be okay, right? So you got to get to work. Build up the land, clear it out, get some work done. But they still, in a way, didn't want to, to do that, right? And I just want to remind you tonight that our Christian, our faith walk, it's not easy. 
I think that's what you can get out of this, right? I think we all agree on this. It's not easy, man. In, in our faith walk, oh my gosh, if, if I'm being honest here, you guys, even as I was prepping this passage this last week, I realized that, and I had to write it down to make sure I get these words out right, that my fear of honesty and vulnerability with others had become a threshold or a stronghold for me. That little thing that I allowed to be in my life. And that, that had to do, again, my fear of honesty and vulnerability with people, had to do with my eyesight. You know, as of last week, and a very few of you know this, I don't think any of you know this in the room right now, I haven't told very many, but as of uh, last Friday, you know, I thought I wasn't going to be able to, I wasn't going to be allowed to drive for the rest of my life. And um, <clears throat> that's something I'd grown up with and had a difficult time sharing and being vulnerable to people about because I had been so hurt in the past with trust and trusting people with things, right? And uh, only, you know, really through this passage and through that struggle, you know, God taught me that I can crush the fear in my life by finding safety in his, in his promises. And through that, it allowed me to be honest and vulnerable and trust people again and really share with them what was going on in my life. And it allowed me to build the, the, the strength of the others around me that I needed to get through what I was going through. I can drive, just so you know. <laughs> I passed the test. So, so thank God, yeah, thank you, thank you. But what we're gonna see at the end of this that I wanna get into and let you guys know is how important the people around you are and how important it is to Satan for you to realize and go away from that, right? He wants to hide you from that. He doesn't want you to understand that. And so what I really like, you guys, is that here in verse 17, as we continue, then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, remember, I love that this is pointed out because this makes us reflect back to what we just talked about a minute ago, the inheritance that was given to them, what they were receiving, what we receive as as God adopts us into his family. So these are the people that he's talking to here. He says, you are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have, an, have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours, for, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they were strong. See, they were fearful. In, in Joshua 1, that's where it talks about they got defeated from the chariots of iron, and so they were pretty fearful about that. And so they they didn't know what to do. They were trying to kind of push it away and not think about it, just allow it to fester, right? But I love how Joshua, um, yeah, Joshua reminds them here, remember where you came from. Remember who you are, who you are a people of. And so that's what I want to ask you, remind you tonight, out of light of all we've talked about, the strongholds in your life, I want you to just simply remember that one thing too. Remember where you came from and whose line you are inherited into and remember how much power that has have you forgotten maybe who are you and where did you come from so speak truth to yourself by this and tonight maybe you can even begin to drive out those enemies of god within the strongholds you know in yourself in your life i want to ask you something here you guys what is jesus asking you to drive out tonight What are you maybe allowing to let linger inside of you? If you're wondering what it could be, maybe even, you know, maybe sometimes you're like me. I'm like, nah, I'm good. I got nothing. I'm all right. (laughs) That's how I grew up. Like every time I hear the pastor, I'm like, I'm good. I'm hungry though. But so what I want you to think about here is think about this. If you are uncertain, this is a danger spot. This is a landmine for your life if you don't look out for it, a warning sign. If you're not sure what it is, maybe try starting with what you might be running away from. Remember, they were running away from these guys. Or what you might even find yourself making excuses for. They were kind of hiding it, simmering it. They didn't want to really talk about it. They were lying. And then it came up. It's the truth laid out as, as as Joshua gave them options. And then the truth is laid out, right? What were they holding back, right? And if it's not any of those, guys, maybe you might even be desiring more of something. You might even be desiring more of something when you already have all you need right in front of you. Remember that through Jesus, he has already given you the power to conquer it. Remember in that verse 17, it says, we are a numerous people. Numerous people, right? And we have great power. 
Remember that. And so imagine, guys, as I close here, imagine if we lived like conquerors through Christ, like it says in Romans 8, right? Through the lens of Christ, not through our lens, not through our own lens, but if we realize and knew that in all things we are conquerors through him who loved us, through him who loved us, through Christ, not our own eyes. Imagine if we use the memory verses like I was talking about before as true sledgehammers into the strongholds of our lives. Imagine if that was our go-to instead of articles online, commentaries, YouTube, like if you're like me, late at night, you fall asleep drooling from YouTube. Imagine if you use the word of God like a sword, what it's supposed to be, to the sledgehammers of the strongholds in your life. And that was your go-to. Remember those passages we're trying to memorize. And the last thing I want to let you guys know is imagine if we could grow, like my, my eyesight issue and what I learned through all this, if we could grow past our fears and discomforts and we decided to grow together in honesty and vulnerability with each other for the sake of strengthening one another against the enemy's strongholds. He's always out there. He always wants to stop us. So remember, we are great people and we have great power. Let's pray. God, I love you, Lord. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a, you know, just a wretched man, Lord. And I just thank you for Jesus, Lord. And I pray that Jesus was seen throughout this passage. Not only that, but your love was seen throughout this passage, Lord, to break through all the strongholds in our lives. May we continue to rely on this family unifying, being honest and vulnerable with each other, standing on the promises of God through the hope of Jesus Christ to break through the strongholds in our lives and not allow it to sit and fester. May we stand strong and not crumble in the end, God, so that we can hear, well done and good faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.